Thanks so much for reading, Veronica. I'd ask us, as always, to keep our Bibles open so we can see what we are studying. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and we will begin. The Bible says, Faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. We praise and thank you, our Father, that you give us the Word of Christ that by it you give us life, that you strengthen our faith. And we pray that that very thing would happen this morning as we hear your words. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to picture the scene. It's a familiar scene. There's a well-meaning father and a well-meaning child, both together out there in the park on the pathway, the child is learning how to ride a bike. And the father very patiently gives all the instructions, the very wise and intelligent instructions about how to ride a bike. But the child thinks he knows better. It's obvious to the father that you put one foot on the pedal and you balance, then you push forward halfway and then keep on going forward as momentum propels you forward. The child is absolutely adamant. No, 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 no. that's not the way. Now you put your feet on at the same time and you go forward. This is an entirely hypothetical, of course, situation never happened. There's a battle. The child insists, insists, and then finally tries it, falls over in a heaped mess. Father walks away, says, well, I told you so. Um, No, of course not. No, the father's very kind and helps the child back up, and the child continues to learn how to ride the bike. It's a trivial example, but in fact, very much what is going on in our passage this morning. The whole question of trust, the whole question of depending on God for his wisdom and his power in his great plans for us individually, but also for his world. We've been following the life of Abraham and Sarah, and as well as being the foundation of faith, of being the beginning of the project that God has to save the world... They are also examples to us of the life of faith. That is what is happening in these passages. Do you remember chapter 12? Out of nowhere, God speaks to this man, Abraham, and begins to recreate a new humanity through him. He's a new Adam for a new creation. And through his offspring, through his future children that he doesn't have, age 75... Somehow, God is miraculously going to produce a nation of people. And then from there, chapter 17 last week, actually a multitude of nations to bless the whole world, to bring out about a new creation, what was planned in the beginning, human beings made in his image to rule this world in a world where all that is wrong and all that spoils has finally been removed. And the means by which God's people engage in that and receive the blessing and are part of his great plan is faith. It's trusting him. And we pray week by week as Christian people, your kingdom come. That is to pray in line with this great project. Lord, bring about your new creation. Save this world. Make it right again. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Do it your way, through your plans and by your means. But do we believe it? And that is the dynamic that is going on in every human heart. And for us as believers in the Lord Jesus, that is the battle that we face every day. As we pray, your kingdom come, do we really want that future outcome? Do we really believe that the kingdom of God and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation of our souls, the resurrection of our bodies, is true blessing? Or do we think we'll find blessing our own way? Your kingdom come and your will be done. Do I really believe that doing it his way, trusting him, obeying him, is the way of true blessing? Or will I find my own way, my own path? which is the constant battle of our hearts. If you're anything like me, and I know you are. And so God wants us this morning to have our faith strengthened 
And he will do so by showing us a foil, Abraham and Sarah. His aim is that we trust him for two reasons in this passage. One, because his plans for us personally and for this world are far better than we could ever imagine. His plans are far better than we could ever imagine. And also, secondly, because his power, that is his ability to execute his plans, are far greater, is far greater than we could ever imagine. So first, the Lord's plans are better than we could ever imagine. This is chapter 17, 15 to 27. And the summary of what's going on in this part of the passage is there in verse 19. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call him Isaac. Just before, last week, we saw in chapter 17 the reiteration of God's promise. The promise given in chapter 12 is reiterated, but this time supersized, as we said last week. There will be offspring from you, Abraham. But not only that, you will become not only Abraham, but Abraham, a multitude of nations, more than you could ever, ever imagine. In chapter uh, 17, verses 10 to 13, then, the covenant sign, that awkward but important sign of circumcision, the seal of God's promise that he would cleanse Abraham or had cleansed Abraham already, counted him righteous and would give him life, seed, that was impossible for him to generate himself. And here and now in verse 15, the Lord continues his speech to Abraham and says that the promise will come through Sarah, his wife, who is 90 years old. Verse 15, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Sarai, Sarah means princess, an echo of this idea of royalty coming from their line. Just like Abraham went from Abraham to Abraham, so too Sarah is given a new name to mark this momentous moment in human history. And again, in another echo, verse 16, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, bless her, bless her twice, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Just as with Abraham, I will bless you, and from you will come royalty. Sarah is the means by which this is going to happen. Of course, we've been listening into the story. We know that isn't what Abraham has thought. He trusted Sarah's alternative vision of Hagar, the servant woman, instead of Sarah herself. And in a sense, we could go from verse 16 right to verse 22 and miss out verses 17 to 21. Verse 22, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. That could be it. Abraham could have obeyed. He'd been given enough evidence of God's goodness and his power time and again, his patience. But then he says, verse 17, or he rather, verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. How absurd. He said to himself under his breath, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred? Abraham, 99 at this stage. By the time a child would be born, a hundred. Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Utterly absurd. Utterly impossible for this to happen in Abraham's mind. And then verse 18, And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Ishmael, who is 13 years old at this stage, in verse 25. Ishmael, who was born to Abraham via Hagar, the servant woman, who's grown up and is presumably loved by his dad. And what looks like a reasonable thing to us, of course, it's understandable in a sense that he'd say, well, use Ishmael, the boy who's already here, is in fact terrible sin. Terrible sin. What Abraham has done has been to circumvent the explicit word of God. Chapter 15, verse 4, your very own son, that is from Sarah. And it was 
patently clear that this alternative human route to achieve the blessing through Hagar was wrong. And still, Abraham says, oh, no, no, no. Lord, you can't do this. It's not the right way. Let me give you some advice. Ishmael, let Ishmael live before you, my son. I'm sure you'll agree the Lord's patience is extraordinary at this point. Verse 19, God said no. No, not that way. Sarah, your own wife, shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac, which means he laughs. The Lord who has a sense of humor in the future, every time, Isaac, Isaac, he laughs, he laughs, he laughs. A reminder, remember? Remember what you thought? Who has the last laugh? Isaac, with him I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Utterly humanly impossible. Human beings thinking we know better than to trust God and his purposes. Try to find another way. But God will bless in his way, according to his purposes, for our good and for his glory. Notice again the kindness of the Lord. He's not callous. Verse 20, as for Ishmael, which means I have heard you, I have heard you. And God goes on to explain blessing, genuine blessing to Ishmael. But, verse 21, I will establish my covenant with Isaac through Sarah this time next year. Abraham then does respond in obedience. Verse 23, then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and he circumcised him and the household. He did it, verse 23 at the end, that very day, promptly. That's repeated in verse 26, that very day. Promptly and also precisely as God had said to him. It's interesting to watch the life of Abraham, sin, disobedience, the patience of the Lord, the grace of the Lord, which brings him back into obedience, back and forth, back and forth, so much like us. The Lord's plans are better than we could ever imagine. The Lord's plans are for the salvation of this world. If you haven't realized, this world is not perfect. More than that, this world is spoiled. This world is under the shroud of death. Death which ultimately spoils everything. Death which has been caused by our human disobedience. And God in his goodness and kindness is in this project of salvation, of a new creation with renewed, rescued, cleansed people. And if you're not a Christian this morning, I'm so glad that you are with us. And there is a lesson for us who are in that, that situation this morning. We will have a view of the way of blessing for our lives and our futures apart from God. But can I tell you, what this passage tells us is that our way will not succeed. We think we know better. We think we've got an Ishmael way of blessing for us. But it will not last. It will not work. It will end in utter tragedy. But not only for those who are not yet followers of the Lord Jesus, also for those of us who have been following Jesus for many years, whose dynamic is so constantly to find an Ishmael, my way. Your kingdom come, but my will be done in my way for my blessing in my life. Too often we believe that God is not for us or good. We try to run life our own way. We try to ride the bike our own way. And that's sin. That is sin. Disobeying God for his means to bring about blessing. And again, it comes down to this belief that God's plans are not good, that somehow we're wiser than him, we're kinder than him, we're better than him, we're more gracious to him. Yet all of the evidence, time and again, is that he is utterly kind, utterly gracious, utterly good. And his ways are for our 
blessing. Those famous verses in Romans, in all things God works for the good of those who love him. He is for us. And his plans are for our blessing. Not what we necessarily think is blessing, not necessarily our vision, but the ultimate good. Salvation, Christ-likeness, true joy that comes from following him. God is a good God whose plans are far better than we could ever imagine. Listen to this from McLaren. God is a father who will give us the best. God sometimes comes to us and lifts us out of some lower kind of good which is perfectly satisfactory to us in order to give us something nobler and higher. God never takes away from us a lower unless the purpose of bestowing upon us a higher blessing. And in practice, this means for us a trust as Christian people in God's, the word is providence. That is his good fatherly sovereignty for our lives. I love the words of the Heidelberg Catechism in this regard. It says, what is the providence of God? Answer, the providence of God is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful years and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. You think of the Lord Jesus in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. And that's what he calls us to, to trust him. Humanly ridiculous. Humanly impossible. Humanly it seems to our damage and not to our good, but ultimately supremely good for us, for our future, for the future of the whole world. And so God wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust him because his plans are far better than we could ever imagine, but also because his power is far greater than we could ever imagine. And for that, we look to verse 1 of chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, and he, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham is having a siesta. He's been doing his work in the morning in the field. He's about to go down for a rest, and all of a sudden, he's met by these divine figures. Verse 2, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he did what was very undignified for a man of his age and seniority. He ran from the tent door to meet them. Such was their significance. And he bowed himself down to the earth. And verse 3, he said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. This is the custom of the ancient Near East. A visitor comes by and you pull out all the stops. Abraham is very understated. Verse 5, I'll bring a morsel of bread. But he does much more than that. Verse 6, you see, three seers of fine flour, Sarah, that is about 16 liters, and he takes the fattened calf in verse 8 and prepares it, and they sit down for a meal. Verse 8, they stood by under the tree, and he stood by them like a servant under the tree while they ate. This is an extraordinary encounter with the Lord himself, exactly what is happening Historians and theologians have puzzled, but it is, at the very least, an encounter with the Lord, a meal with the living God. And in verse 9, the action really begins. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Interesting, they know her name without ever having met her. And verse 10 The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son, precisely as promised just a moment ago. Sarah, at this point, is leaning in at the curtain, 
listening in to what is going on at the tent. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. And verse 12, just as her husband, so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, I am worn out and my Lord is old. Shall I have pleasure? I need to save our blushes, but it's pretty graphic. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. I am, I'm an old woman. And my, my Lord is old. There's no way we're going to do what needs to be done for a child to come about. In verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, again, Sarah is challenged. She says she did not laugh. The Lord says you did laugh. Again, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac. Just as with her husband, this ongoing perpetual memory in time to come that this child, this miraculous child, this life from the dead, this human impossibility made possible by God, reminded day after day of what he had done. And again, there is a profound lesson, I think, for us. Sin is not trusting God in his word. Hagar, Hagar was the evidence that Sarah had not trusted that the Lord was able to do the impossible. And in here again is the doubt that God is able to bring blessing to us individually and blessing for the world in his means. And instead the belief that somehow we might be able to do it in our own way, by our own means. The words there in verse 14 are worth meditating on. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is, of course, no. Jesus speaking about that rich man who looked so impressive that Jesus said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples at that point are aghast. How can anyone be saved? Answer... With man it is impossible, but all things are possible with God. And God's word to us is not only that his plans are far better than we could imagine, his power is far greater than we could ever conceive. God is able to bring the cosmos into existence. God is able to bring out of two as good as dead, not my words, the words of the writers of the Hebrews, to as good as dead human beings who ought to have been heading to the geriatric ward but turned to the maternity ward, life, and a multitude of nations. And we can trust as his people that he will bring salvation for us personally in a way which is utterly humanly impossible and to bring salvation to this world in a way which is beyond our imagining. Before 1979, the Islamic Revolution in Iran took place. Sorry, it took place in 1979. Before that, there were only a few hundred converts to Christianity in that country. The majority was obviously Islam. And yet for the last 44 years, there has been wave after wave of persecution against Iranian Christians. The Bible in the national language of Farsi is prohibited. Evangelizing is outlawed. Christian leaders have been arrested and persecuted. But in the past decade, Iran has been one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Now they estimate around a million in that country. God is able to do what is humanly utterly impossible. Think of those who are in your family who don't know Christ. He can do it. Think of this city which is so turned against the Lord for our own harm and to our own detriment. Humanly speaking, utterly impossible. Yet is there anything that is too hard for the Lord? 
God wants us to grow our trust in him. And then this morning, as we look at Abraham and Sarah, he wants to tell us that his plans for our lives are far, far better than we could ever imagine. We can trust him. He's a good father. He won't let us fall as we cycle through this life. And more than that, his power to save us, to bring good in our lives and the lives of those so desperately needing in this world is far greater than we could ever imagine. Let's pray together. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Father, forgive us where so often our hearts are led astray from you, where we think we know better, where we believe in our own power to achieve blessing. And we ask that for each of us, you would touch our hearts and move us to repentance where that's appropriate and that you would strengthen us in greater faith in your goodness, in your plans, in your purposes, in your power. And we ask this for the glory of your Son. And in his name we pray. Amen.